Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce, to introduce Daniel, Daniel, Dr. Daniel Egloff. Uh, <coughs> Daniel is one of these people who've migrated from the world of theoretical physics into the world of uh, high finance uh, in the sort of citadel of finance in, 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 in Switzerland. Uh, and um, he is a consultant in the quantitative finance uh, industry uh, uh, and is a part of a company called Incube uh, Advisory, Incube Con um, uh, Consulting. But as part of their work with uh, using <coughs> F Sharp in up to, I think, uh, um, in four major European finance institutions, they um, have developed what is a really uh, fabulous uh, stack for GPU programming uh, with, with F Sharp. And it's one of these, um, uh, you know, w one thing that particularly attracts me to this line of work is how solidly it's been proven, the utility of the work has been proven in, uh, in, 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 the, in the, what can be, you know, quite a difficult area to work in to actually get really solid business relevant results in the area of quantitative finance. Uh, and, um, you know, again and again, I know I've been watching Daniel and uh, Alia, Quantalia and Incube's work over the last uh, four years. And they've made, you know, just r remarkable uh, use of the combination of F-sharp and GPU programming. Uh, now, the, the framework, which Daniel will be talking about uh, today, is available for much broader use as well. And there are free license uh, options available for that. It's available as a NuGet package. You can, you know, the, the blogs about it. You can just download. I know it's been used for uh, machine learning applications, uh, deep belief machine learning applications as well. And so it's one of these uh, areas of work for you know applied programming f uh, framework in in heterogeneous systems, really applied through to real world use. And it's, uh, my uh, thank you for coming along and talking to us today. Thanks for introducing me, Don. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. So today I speak about taming GPU threats with F Sharp and our new tool, Chain Alia GPU. So that's the new version that will come out probably early next year. What you will find on the web is still the old technology. Well, old, it's not that old, but still a bit older, which is under the name Alia Cubase. Uh, if you need to have more details, just uh, Grab me afterwards and I can give you further pointers. Good. So a brief introduction, myself. Um, I'm partner at Incube and managing director of Quantalia. Incube is a technology-driven financial service company and uh, Quantalia is a software and solution provider for high performance and GPU computing. Both companies are based in Zurich and since beginning of this year, uh, Quantalea is a 100% subsidiary of Incube. I start with a brief introduction to general purpose GPU programming because I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with this technology, so I explain a bit the background uh, about different software stacks that are available and how you use them. Then I introduce our new Alea platform. I introduce now the version 2, and I show you what will be available in this new release that is coming up. Then I give a few examples how you actually use this technology. This will still be based on the actual version, so you will see actual code that you can also run and play with. Uh, and then I finish my talk with a short introduction into a very new programming model that we developed together with the Swiss University. It's the Alia Reactive Data Flow programming model, which should simplify GPU programming and heterogeneous programming a lot, so that a programmer doesn't need to know any GPU know-how in principle in order to write GPU code. So GPUs are getting more and more important thanks to advances in GPU hardware and software. 
uh, the world of high performance uh, computing is undergoing a revolution. GPUs redefine numerical computing in many fields and industries. First of all, in oil and gas, that was mainly the starting point where you got big success uh, about five years back. Life science, bioinformatics, medicine, engineering, defense, and finance. Nowadays, uh, one of the biggest GPU market is probably machine learning, where uh, people do uh, deep uh, architecture training with GPUs significantly faster than with cl uh, clusters of CPUs. GPUs can process heavy compute load much faster than CPUs. They improve also user experience with better graphics, more uh, reality, and completely new user interfaces. And they deliver performance with less size, less weight, and less power, and therefore directly reduce costs. We believe that GPUs will be more important in the future, even more important than they are now. First of all, there are more and more compute-intensive applications because of bigger data. And there is a fast-growing mobile device and embedded systems market. And this will boost, again, GPUs. On the software side, we have CUDA and OpenCL. These two <coughs> technologies simplified general-purpose GPU programming a lot because the developer did not need to think anymore how he would map a computation to a graphics context and then use a shader language to code the algorithms. But CUDA and OpenCL are not the only technology that are available for a general purpose GPU programming. You have Microsoft Direct Compute, you have C++ AMP, also by Microsoft, both running on Windows. Then recently Google came up with RenderScript running on Android, and even more recently Apple introduced Metal on iOS. These technologies are not used as widespread as CUDA and OpenCL, but they're clearly underlining the importance of GPUs because nowadays on every platform you have at least one or more GPU technologies to do general purpose computing. So why is CUDA and OpenCL so popular? I think there are many reasons for that. First of all, it's a very simple uh, programming model uh, for massively parallel hardware with many threads based on a single instruction multiple data idea. That's the most important uh, factor, I would say. Then they deliver performance because the programming model is actually somehow reflecting the GPU hardware in a very good way. And then they are easy to learn because CUDA and OpenCL, they're both based based on C, and C is a well-known general purpose programming language. Algorithms, as I said before, can now be coded in such a language and you don't need to go out to, to shaders. There are many books, tutorials, examples, and training, so you can learn it easily. The scalability comes right away from the programming model itself, which is another important factor. Then you have good tooling support. You have support in Visual Studio uh, for debugging, for profiling. You have support in, uh, in uh, Eclipse also for debugging and profiling, which simplifies developing a lot. And then you have good platform support. It runs on almost any operating system. It runs on desktops, on servers, and clusters. And now there is growing support for mobile devices and embedded systems. So the CUDA and OpenCL software development environment is uh, based uh, or provided by the, the vendors like NVIDIA, AMD, or Intel. They're, they're based on, on C++. Um, I wouldn't say that C++ is obsolete as a programming language or technology, but today there are more modern alternatives. So we may ask, our, uh, uh, we may ask the question, what would a modern language bring us as a benefit to program GPUs? To understand this, we have to look at 
the anatomy of a GPU accelerated code. We find that a significant amount of code is actually CPU code. And the CPU code is actually needed to prepare the data and to orchestrate the computation. So data preparation might require reorganization of the data, bundling, transposing, padding. Computations have to be delayed until they can be fired off on the GPU. Then different problem sizes and hardware architectures require different algorithmic implementations. And then some standard use cases can be very well uh, done with a collection of, or with a combination of performance primitives like a parallel map, scan, reduce, or matrix multiplication. And only a fraction of the code base is really hand-tuned, optimized GPU code. And for this, you need the full flexibility of CUDA and o or OpenCL. So our project experience really is that such a code is easier to be developed with a modern programming language, such as, for instance, F-sharp or C-sharp. And that was one of our main motivation to actually build our own stack of GPU software uh, or GPU development tool kit uh, to be faster and to be more productive. For instance, functional programming pattern can be used very nicely for the delayed computations. Pattern matching can be very nicely used for uh, dispatching of uh, complex algorithms. Good container support and link is very uh, handy if you need to prepare the data. And automated resource management and garbage collection gives us cleaner code and improves runtime robustness. So from a developer point of view, a native implementation of CUDA or OpenCL in one of these modern languages is a win. So first of all, more productivity. Another important aspect now is cross-platform. That's the second big benefit. This is much easier to achieve with a language like F-sharp or C-sharp and a runtime system like .NET or Mono. Now, there are several available native implementations of CUDA and OpenCL in the market. So for instance, you have Numba Pro, the Numba Pro compiler for Python, which has a minimal set of CUDA exposed to Python. Then there is Upper API, which compiles Java code to OpenCL. This project is an open source project now and initiated by AMD. And then there is our tool chain, Alea GPU, which is capable to compile all .NET languages to GPUs. All other approaches that we are aware of are somehow either kind of a wrapping solution, they expose an API with uh, interop in a managed uh, uh, context, or they create intermediate C code, which is then actually compiled with the original vendor-specific OpenCL or uh, CUDA development toolchain to executable GPU code. So this second approach of just generating C code underneath uh, is from a developer point of view not that what you really want to have because you can't really uh, get a good tooling, for instance debugging, profiling at the source code level of the original host language is relatively tricky. And it also is not so uh, well suited for cross-platform portability because you always pull in some C runtime dependencies. So that's the reason why we've actually built our own platform, Alea uh, GPU. And I would like to explain you now what this platform is. So Alea GPU is a platform for professional GPU development on .NET. We really want to be professional in the sense that we have best tooling and best developer experience uh, in the market. Our upcoming version 2 is targeting just CUDA. OpenCL can come in the future. It depends a bit how OpenCL will uh, evolve in the market. And we target mainly NVIDIA GPUs because they are they are supporting CUDA. We support 
GeForce consumer GPUs, we support the Tesla and Quadra Enterprise GPUs, and we also support <coughs> the Tegra mobile GPUs. Doesn't CUDA insulate you from which particular GPUs you're targeting? Isn't that the whole point? Well, it does, yes, yes. So why do you need to enumerate which GPUs you support? Just support everything CUDA supports? Yeah, we support so all CUDA GPUs. All CUDA GPUs. Well, there support. is a small exception. There is a little difference between mobile and non-mobile GPUs. But, well. Right, right. Right. So, now it will be available and run under Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and it's fully cross-platform. So whenever you build an assembly on one, yeah, hard, uh, on one operating system, it will run uh, on the others as well. So that is already working very nicely. Um, we have uh, almost a, a, a public beta ready. So let's have a look at the different layers, how the system is built. So at the bottom, you have a CUDA-enabled GPU. And then on top of that, you have the Alia runtime. The Alia runtime is responsible for actually compiling the, the PTX code down to executable CUDA code and launching the computations. It also manages the GPU resources that are available on, on a GPU. The next layer are the compilers. We have multiple compilers. I will detail that just afterwards. The compilers generate efficient GPU code from any .NET language and they also create meta information for debugging and profiling and they provide the tooling support uh, for inside debugger within Visual Studio. Then we have the language li layer. Here we have to enable CUDA programming in C Sharp, VB and F Sharp which means we have somehow to extend the language uh, appropriately or write CUDA in terms of an internal DSL in F-sharp. That's the way how we do it in F-sharp. In C-sharp, you have more an object model and, and also in VB. So this is a library, not a, not a change. You haven't changed the F-sharp compiler. Well, uh, it's not a library. So actually, we have library <laughs> components. But then uh, we actually analyze, say, F-sharp quotations. And then we compile those to uh, LLVM IR and from there to GPU code. And it's a bit different for the C-sharp there uh, and, and VB. That's the different compiler stream. Uh, well, I, I jumped now a bit ahead. There we actually um, uh, analyze IL code and compile IL to LLVM IR and then to GPU code. So it's actually really kind of two parts. It's a library plus a compiler. Mm -hmm. So that's the language layer. And then on top of the language layer, we have the library layer. We've realized that's really important because many of our clients, they, they could use uh, uh, the language to actually code GPU uh, code, but whenever they faced complicated problems, they got stuck. Uh, everybody who has written a very effective scan or reduce algorithm on a GPU knows about that. So we've came to the conclusion Bindings for important libraries that are shipped with uh, video tools like Kublas, QFFT, uh, or now very recently they uh, just uh, released a library for, um, for uh, AI primitives, uh, neural network training, uh, the QDNN library. So these libraries have to be exposed in our system. And then we also should have hand-tuned performance primitives for the basic parallel algorithms like scan, reduce, map, sort, parallel random numbers, uh, matrix multiplication, and other kind of like, like, for instance, trigonal system solvers. That should be available uh, so that you have a complete ecosystem for computing. That's in the library layer. And then also in the library layer, you will find the Alia Reactive Data Flow Programming API. Have the equivalent to like OpenCL Blast, OpenCL. Open Unfortunately, FFD. not. Unfortunately, not. That's one of the strengths of uh, CUDA. CUDA has a much wider and larger ecosystem than OpenCL, especially in the scientific computing uh, domain. So you, so you have a, a very good library of uh, uh, Blast uh, algorithms, high, highly tuned, uh, Fourier transform. That's all not there in uh, OpenCL. It's getting more and more complete, but it's still behind. 
So now the compiler, uh, half of it is already answered by the question that uh, just got asked. So we have actually mainly two compilation streams. One compilation stream uh, is, in a sense, the old scheme, which is implemented in F-sharp. So you take F-sharp, you write F-sharp quotations with uh, a CUDA DSL, and these quotations are then compiled uh, to LLVM IR, and from there to PTX with the CUDA driver. That's version 1.x. Now with version 2, we have a second compilation stream, which actually takes again F-sharp, C-sharp code. Uh, there you have to code the kernel a bit different. You have to overload a certain member function of a class, and you have to tag that with certain attributes, and then we understand that. And then again, you can use certain specific symbols, which are in a sense an internal DSL for CUDA, and then we can compile this code to, uh, we can analyze IL and we can compile IL to IR, to LLVM IR, and from there again to PTX with the CUDA driver. What is also important is that actually we have two ways of compilation. We have the so-called dynamic compilation, which can happen at runtime, which is very handy because it allows you to do GPU scripting, for instance, in the F-sharp interactive console. That's a very handy feature if you want to explore GPU algorithms at runtime, play with it, improve it, see the effect, understand it. Uh, or using it in a notebook programming style. That's also a very nice application for this dynamic compilation. Banks use that uh, in a different way. There, a trader enters a new derivative contract with a new formula for the payoff, and then this formula is directly compiled into the GPU kernel at runtime, so they don't need to actually go through the whole process of um, kind of deploying a new system for just this new derivative contract, which is a slight modification of an existing one, but have, has a very specific new formula in there. So that's a real-world use case of dynamic compilation. The other one is ahead-of-time compilation. There you actually trade for fastest... Uh, application launch time, uh, trade against flexibility. Uh, there you just l embed your compiled resources into the assembly so that you can l uh, load it again at uh, application startup. That's the traditional compilation scheme. Our performance is the same as CUDA CC++ because we use all the optimization paths that LLVM uh, and NNVM, so that's the NVIDIA backend for cheap computing all these optimization paths are used, and therefore our code runs at the same speed. So, now I come to the heart of the talk. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know about GP computing already. Okay, so quite a few. So, But nevertheless, I think it's, it's good to, to start with the CUDA crash course or OpenSeal is pretty much the same. The programming model, they are, they are so close. They use different words for the same things, but that's about it. So the first important abstraction in CUDA is a kernel. A kernel is nothing else than a function executing sequential code in parallel in many threads. Then threads are not just there one by one. They are grouped uh, in blocks and then multiple blocks of the same size, they are grouped into a grid. Now, a thread in a block has an identifier, the so-called thread index. It's a three-dimensional index, x, y, z. Then each block has a size, block team x, y, z, also along the coordinate axis of your block. Uh, remember, the blocks are always of the same size. And similar, a block has an identifier in the grid, which is the block index x, y, z, again, three-dimensional. These three dimensions, comes, that's com that is coming from graphics, obviously. Uh, there is a little typo there, I just see, think, with block index z is wrong. Then we have grid size, again, which tells you how many blocks in each different coordinate axis you have. And then what is important now is these threads are in a block are not all, uh, scheduled one by one. They're always scheduled 
in a, in a group of typically 32 threads, and that's called a warp. That's a, a finer sub-level. And we will have an example just now which makes use of that. Why is that important? A warp is executing as a unit, which means each thread does the same instruction at each step. If one thread requires a branch because of an if, then all the, uh, the statements in the if or else branch are executed by all the threads, even if they don't need to do that. So one issue is actually branch divergence in, in a warp, w which would slow down the performance, and that's one of the uh, most important optimizations at the low level of, uh, of CUDA coding. So just to begin with these blocks, is a little sort of, I should think of a little 3D chunk of threads. You, yeah. you draw it. You, yeah. Your pictures are kind of 1D. Yeah, it's really 1D. There's, well, uh, yeah, it's 1D, but, but it should be 3D. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. yes. Then, so, so these warps are then like sub-chunks of blocks of 32 threads. Yes, it's actually going like that. You have a block of threads, and then they start to enumerate the threads in the block and just taking the first 32, uh, that's the first warp, and okay. goes on, right? And it, right. And it goes first along the, the X coordinate, and then set, uh, a Y and Z coordinate. So it's linearizing the, the x, y, z coordinates, yes. Yeah. And then obviously the, the, you have also different memory uh, memories like shared memories, uh, device memories, constant memories, texture memories, and uh, many other details which we don't need to know at this stage to understand the example. So I skipped that. Now what I want to show you is uh, an advanced GPU algorithm that you can write in F-sharp. Um, I will show you several implementations. Uh, and the reason why I chose this algorithm is because it shows you what you can do in F sharp. You can really extend F sharp so nicely uh, so that it becomes a new language knowing about CUDA and not just knowing about a small part of CUDA, knowing almost everything of CUDA. Also the, the detailed uh, things like loop unrolling, like warp level synchronization, all specific uh, performance primitives like uh, a shuffle instruction, uh, and more. So just one last thing, the, the kernel, yep. the function executing spread going in parallel with many threads, is that a grid's worth of code, in effect? Uh, it, it's kind of... Is that, is that one grid execution, or is it maybe multiple? It's, it's actually one function, but for each thread, uh, this function is being executed. So you can understand it like that. You have many instances of that function, uh, operate each one operating in a thread, and okay. this thread is in a block, and this block is part of the grid. And by the way, why do you have these blocks? These blocks are somehow reflecting the GPU hardware. A GPU is not a, a linear collection of threads. It, it has this architecture, this, this kind of uh, grouping. You have single threads, which are then uh, kind of scheduled uh, uh, <coughs> as a group, and each GPU consists of multiple streaming multiprocessors, and the streaming multiprocessor looks like a block, in a sense. Right? And typically, one of these streaming multiprocessors is executing, in fact, multiple blocks, so you can switch very fastly between the blocks. I think my question was more basic than that. So one of these threads, these wiggly things you draw, yep. is that, could that be multiple kernels, or is it the other way around, that a kernel consists of multiple you know, sequential grids? Uh, the, the kernel consists of multiple uh, threads, yeah. So you have one, one kernel uh, running in all these threads. You have one grid per kernel, and so it's just a specification of how many threads you ultimately want to launch <coughs> okay. to run that kernel. So it's kind of kernel grid. They, they, yeah, you have okay. one, so one, when, you, when you launch a kernel, you have a specification that says, I want this number of threads, and I want them arranged in, this, in okay. these positions. Right. Um, so they can then be split onto the stream multiprocessors. Okay. So that, that's an additional information you have to provide to the, to the function. You have to tell the function how it should be executed. So you have to describe which thread topology you will going to use, which means how many threads per block, as he said, and then how wide the grid is in each coordinate axis. And you have to tell other things like how much shared memory you want to have, for instance, in that block. And this shared memory is then used by all the, th uh, the kernels running in that block so they can communicate between each other. There are some more details there. Okay, so now the first algorithm. 
I want to show you a warp scan performance primitive which does a scan at the warp level. So we just look at 32 threads, uh, they have data, and we want to do the scan, which means just each element uh, or each thread has the sum uh, of, its L, uh, of its predecessors. We want to do that in a very advanced uh, GP programming uh, way. It should be highly optimized. We want to dispatch for different architectures. We want to use different optimization schemes, in particular for compute capability three, which is the so-called Kepler architecture of NVIDIA. We want to use the shuffle instruction. And for pre-compute uh, capability three, uh, we want to use shared memory. And this dispatching logic is done with pattern matching. So in this picture, you see how it is working. Uh, I show you the, uh, the implementation with a, a shuffle. A shuffle instruction is a very uh, nice uh, communication operation. So if you say shuffle a variable up one, you do a communication between the th uh, threads in a warp. So you shift somehow a data element that you have in thread one to thread uh, two and the element you have in thread two to thread three and so on. Right. So that's depicted here. So he, he, now let me see if you have the, What happens to the one in set thread 32? So, excuse me? What happens to the one in, in the top thread, thread well, 32? That's kind of just shifted out. Oh, just thrown away? Yeah. Okay. Then there is a rotate as well where it comes in at the bottom. So there are different variations of shuffle. Mm -hmm. So here you have the data in, the th uh, in these 32. Well, here I have a little reduction. It's just 16. So then with the shuffle, you move this data element up to here, this up to here, and so on. And then you add this and this together. And this one is just copied down. So that's the first step of your scan. Then so you add, is the add, the add or multiply add? or whatever. You have a binary operation uh, which does your, for, over which you scan. Right? It, it doesn't need to be add. That's another aspect. Uh, we can actually uh, nicely uh, take any F-sharp function, just decorate it with reflected definition and use it in the framework. Also very nice application of F-sharp code quotations. So then, Level uh, second round is now you shift your data by offset two and you add it again up, then by four and then by eight and then you're done. So that's uh, kind of a relatively simple way of, of doing your scan in a parallel way. And the interesting thing is that this shuffle up instruction doesn't need any further memory and it is being executed roughly in, in one step. It's a very fast implementation. So let's have a look at the code. So anybody not familiar with F-sharp? So everybody is familiar with F-sharp? <laughs> OK. So let's start with a, with a test. So we have written a test. Here you see uh, a computation workflow, computation workflow, the CUDA workflow. In this, you actually describe your computation. You uh, manage all the resources, and you do all the memory allocations you need to do, and you have a so-called entry function, which is just the entry function to start the computation on the GPU. It takes a program, which is the compiled GPU uh, module. From there, you extract resources, like the kernel. You do memory preparation. Uh, here, I've just coded also the test for convenience. And what is important here, you describe how you would like to launch your kernel. 
that's really the block and the grid size which you specify there. Once you've done that, you can just launch your kernel with these parameters <laughs> and you supply, for instance, some memory for input and output that you allocated before. Here I allocate input. I use the use binding to profit from garbage collection, automatic resource management. Here, similar output. And once I'm done, once, uh, if I'm done with my kernel, I can actually just copy all the data back from the GPU to the CPU, do some further work with it. Uh, this way I can code uh, any CPU function which does underneath some GPU calculation. Here I don't need to give any further arguments. I could supply here additional arguments which are then exposed again to the workflow and you get an ordinary function. What I need to do now, I somewhere define my computation here. That's my template. It's kind of my computation workflow. We call it template because nothing happens yet. So this template is, has an entry point of a function unit to unit, so it doesn't expect anything and it returns anything. So what you do now, down here, you grab your default GPU here and you just tell the GPU load please this template in down from CPU to GPU, compile it with this compilation configuration. Mm -hmm. That can be just optimized configuration or diagnostics configuration for some profiling. We do that right after. And then you just call run. That's all. So here all the compilation happens and here you actually run it. The run method then kicks off this function which runs in, uh, which ends up in this function and does the computation. So that's the, the big picture. And now we have to look at the, at the fine details. <clears throat> so, but actually before, uh, let's, let's try to debug that. So if you install um, inside debugger, you get here a menu where you can select start CUDA debugging. So that you, in order that you can debug, you have to compile it, compile your code with the right configurations. I've done that here in my test. Here I use this diagnostics configuration which brings in all the meta information. <clears throat> and then let me see which one with its shuffle. Yep. What's the difference? When you went to debugging, there was a different. You had GPU debugging and CUDA debugging. What's the difference? Well, that is mainly needed for graphics, OpenGL stuff, which is also supported by NVIDIA, and that's really the CUDA. We just use that one. Yeah. And you also have graphics debugging here. Okay. So, I need to select now this project as a startup project. What is very nice now, um, I can set breakpoints also in code quotations. Let me see. Here is a code quotation. This code quotation actually prepares the data for the warp scan and then, then actually calls the warp scan here. Right. So a code quotation in F-sharp is written uh, within the limiters here and here. So this code is actually compiled to a syntax tree and this syntax tree is then interpreted by our compiler. What is very nice with uh, the new tooling, I can now set a breakpoint within a code quotation. That was not possible with the older tooling. Thanks to Microsoft for fixing that. So here I put the breakpoint. And then actually here, 
I call out to my inclusive scan algorithm. I just give it an operator, an F-sharp operator for the scan. And this scan is actually just a certain implementation, whatever that is, depending on the architecture which is selected at runtime. How should I read underscore eval? So that's a special, uh, yeah, that's a special function which runs this piece of code on the GPU. So it's kind of a wrapper because that is not necessarily a uh, quotation. It can be just a function. You say it's a special function, so implemented in F sharp by you in yep. particular library. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is part of the uh, DSL for CUDA pr uh, programming that we provide. It takes an expression and splits it off, right? So, so, like okay, so it take, takes some code and runs it on the GPU. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I think you should read it as splicing in one syntax tree, one part of the GPU program into a into that location. Oh, it tries to it says, but it has to run it. It's, it's expo of t to t. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like it takes a syntax. Yeah, tree. but because it's in it's in the. It's just, it, it's just a quotation splicing operator. It's inserting it and then because it's combining the, it and then it compiles everything as, as one block. So it's just metaprogram including another metaprogram including another metaprogram. That's all. Okay. So I've set a breakpoint. Now, typically you need to rerun or recompile it because there are some uh, <laughs> tooling uh, limitations that uh, the debugger does not recognize if the code is dirty. So let, let's quickly build that. It's relatively quick. Then I start my debug. So I'm here in my quotation. So now I can step through. By the way, that's uh, an implementation detail. Um, typically, some algorithms, they need some additional resources like shared memory. So they can advertise that and then you, you actually allocate it where you need it. So here I have my temp storage, which is required by the algorithm. Then I do some thread index stuff, prepare my data. And now I actually go into my inclusive scan implementation. Um, I go through my next uh, quotation here. I'm in this implementation of, you see, I've done a pattern matching based on my architecture, what it is. I land in here. I have here a record of different implementations for the different uh, scan variations that I need to do. I can step in further. I come to this actual function which does the work. And here I'm in my function doing the actual scan. And here you see a few additional details. You have a function to get the lane of a, th uh, of a warp. That's the thread index in a warp from 0 to 31. Um, you have pr uh, unrolling features for loops, that this loop is really fully unrolled. And here there is this shuffle up instruction that you can use. Uh, what I can do now, I have some uh, warp watch windows. Bring that over here. And you see I have 32 threads, and I can now say kind of, I need to step one more. <coughs> Sorry, I pulled it out again. Step one more. Oh, I lost it. Sorry. Tooling is not yet fully precise, 
Sometimes I have to be careful because uh, I lose my, my uh, line number. Let me do that again. So I step in. So now I can use my warp watch windows to display variables like lane. ID. I can also check what is in going into my temp. I can check what is going into my, what is coming from my output. So you see now what happens with the shuffle. I had the output where I had the original values. And then I did this shuffle, which, uh, uh, which is done with a, an index one. So the four goes to here, the six goes to here, and so on. And then I do the next one, offset two. I do the next one with offset four, and so on. So you can analyze precisely what happens with your data at each step of your algorithm. You also see that some values here, if you look at, <coughs> at your locals, that they do not display any values anymore. That is a problem which is also in the CUDA C uh, debug, uh, debugger because the registers are highly optimized because otherwise the kernel cannot even run. So very often these are out of scope and therefore they don't have any values. To get around that issue, you would normally have to uh, store them into some uh, device memories or additional variables so that the, the compiler is forced to keep them. So that's the debugging and how you can step into the different layers of our implementation. You see here, very nicely, you just give an F-sharp function to this GPU code. You decorate this member function with the reflected definition. And if you pass in such a binary operator, you also have it you have to give it this attribute in order that you get the abstract syntax tree through uh, code quotations. Otherwise, you can program with types uh, as you like. Uh, you can decorate any member function with reflected definition and use it on the GPU. And you can use kind of data structures uh, like tuples and records. And you also can use pattern matching within uh, GPU code. Not all the uh, language features of F Sharp are exposed in a code quotation uh, to write GPU code. There are some limitations, but limitations uh, uh, become less and less over time. What happens if you don't follow one of the limitations? Then the compiler reports you an error message, which is more or less useful in order uh, that you can find out what the problem was. Um, it's That's pretty. Uh, the compiler. So the, this is the compiler that runs when you say load. Exactly. Normal. So not it, the compiler that runs this moment. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's actually the compiler which then compiles the GPU code or the right. quotation. So, so we are. Happens a long time later. Exactly. You always have two levels of compilation. You have a design time compilation of your F# -sharp code mm -hmm. through the F# -sharp compiler, and then once you start uh, your GPU code, it's dynamically compiled at runtime. That's option one or it's compiled ahead of time, uh, again, through uh, 
through some tooling int uh, integration, which we currently do with FODI. Uh, and then uh, it, the errors are reported at, uh, uh, at uh, compilation time. So you had this pattern matching, which is depending on the number of threads available or the size of the kind of device that was available or the input sizes, you choose different paths for the scan yep. operation. So if you're just using the dynamic compilation, there could be, and you're, you know, you'd only be going down one of those paths, presumably. So there could yep. be sort of compile time bugs hidden away in those other paths, which you'd only hit which once you don't you'd only actually see. Actually yes, yes, yes. Okay. Similar, you, similar you, thing with uh, C++ meta template programming. Same problem, when, right? When you use the compile time, so everything done at compile time yes. using yeah. Fodi or yeah. whatever, yeah. everything gets compiled. Yes. Yeah. All the possible there ways. you actually really have to say which variations of the algorithm you have to compile, yes. Some other interesting implementations, if you look at um, now the warp-based implementation, which is pretty much the same thing, but instead of using the shuffle, we actually copy everything into shared memory and then <coughs> accessing it from there. And we allocate a bit more shared memory in order to avoid uh, if uh, statements to figure out uh, 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 boundary conditions. <clears throat> so this comes in here. This little trick avoids you uh, one if. And here you see you, you can do static asserts, like for instance that this one is a constant. Uh, again, the loop unrolling, uh, step and offset need to be compiled time statics. <clears throat> so you can enforce that, which helps a lot uh, to make the code more robust. Right. So. So obviously these primitives like ScanSep and the other ones are, they're, they're really low, very imperative, yeah. very imperative programming yes. in Dunham F F Sharp. As you, and as you move up to use these, obviously you get more and more functional yes. in feeling, yeah. but you still have this imperative yes. memory, Each kernel sorry, is you, have, you have this imperative memory management yeah. process. Yeah. But besides that memory management, memory transfers, as Malix and, and, and uh, <coughs> Gather process, uh, when you're upper level, okay? That's more functional, that, yes. Yeah, everything, is, every, everything else in that layer ends up pretty compositional and functional. Yes, and it's all built into the computational uh, workflow idea with the CUDA for workflow. Man for and this is composable, again, uh, very nicely. So depending on how you organize it, you can put the algorithms together. Uh, you can share resources. <coughs> And so on, right? Yeah. So, in in sort of applied practical applied work, like in a when working on a, in a in, for a finance institution, how much of your time is spent writing the imperative primitives, and how much is spent composing them, and how much? We bring this into in, uh, uh, into each project because it normally takes too long. Such an algorithm can easily take a month. Uh, probably not this one, but. Uh, that's just now the lowest level, that's at the warp level. Then from the warp level, you have to go to the block level. And then from the block level, you have to go up to the device level. <clears throat> so you have multiple levels how you need to scale the algorithm and uh, the code gets more and more complicated because you have to do more and more things like aligning data, uh, considering special cases like uh, non-equal power of two cases and so on. So that's quite tricky also to test and normally we, we we deliver that as, a, as an asset for the customer. And then most of the, uh, of the coding effort is wiring these components together and writing then some specific kernels. But as I said, roughly, it's hard to say, it's a small fraction of the code is hand-optimized GPU code. Most of it is really plumbing. And there again, f -sharp is a great tool because it uh, facilitates that significantly. So you guys have are these reusable assets, uh, and those are in a certain sense your intellectual property, or which you come to the customers with, yep. and, you, yeah. and you. I mean, even writing selling them configurations yeah. of these things. Even writing a good parallel random number generator is, is a big uh, is a is a big job. Does one of those not ship with CUDA anyway? Well, they do. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You could actually directly use them. Some of them uh, can be used because they have a good interface. Others are hard to actually put into this framework because it's a, a C function which you then just can call, you need to interrupt with it, and that's probably not what you want to have because it uh, hinders your flexibility quite a bit. So whenever you want to share 
or optimize the resources, you need to have full control on your algorithm because all lower uh, algorithms, they need to somehow report what shared memory uh, they need and you have to take uh, that into the consideration if you build uh, the top level algorithms. So that's the first example. So here you see you can do pretty much everything you can do in CUDA, CUDA C. Uh, again here, uh, some cost of uh, some union storage memory, which is also a feature that is needed uh, to optimize the usage of shared memory. Because that's a very scarce use resource, so you, you have to be careful how you use it. And uh, we've seen that in many low-level primitives, uh, it's, it's a handy thing to have, uh, this kind of uh, union storage. Okay. So the next algorithm is a bit higher up. The next algorithm is a specific matrix multiplication and this comes from a real project. So quite often uh, you have more or less rectangular matrices, big matrices that you want to multiply and you get back a big matrix. Uh, th this is a standard use case which is very well handled with, uh, by NVIDIA Kublas. Uh, they have uh, very powerful algorithms for doing that. Uh, it gets very different if you have, say, slim matrices. So A is very, has very, uh, a very large number of columns <coughs> and a very small number of rows. We speak about half a million to a million columns and roughly 10, 20 rows. Then B is similar, uh, half a million rows and only a few columns. So that's one thing. And then another thing is sometimes, depending on the context, you need to weight a matrix with a probability vector uh, V, uh, which you expand row-wise to a matrix uh, of the same size as A. So um, the rows are all the same vectors. And then you do an element-wise multiplication. Uh, then you get a weighted matrix. And you need to multiply this uh, matrix uh, A weighted with V, with B, and then you get X. This is a use case which uh, appeared in an inner loop, in an optimizer, uh, to calculate the Hessian. And uh, this very special structure uh, is not very well handled with, uh, by Kublas. So you, had, you have to implement your own algorithm. Now, how can you do that? One approach is to use some performance primitives and build on those. Uh, the idea is um, you have, first of all, you do a two-step reduction. You reduce your big matrices into a small one, X prime, which you then, uh, do, uh, which you then reduce in one step down to the result. So the interesting thing is how you reduce uh, A, V, and B to X prime. So what you do for uh, a combination of rows of A and B uh, you, and, and V, <coughs> you actually uh, have per line, per lane, you have blocks of threads. So that's your grid. Yeah, sort of point out that we're almost up on the hour. Okay. So if you want a couple more minutes. Yep. So you reduce First of all, a thread reduces these elements here, and then within a block, you do a horizontal reduction. This can be done very nicely again with primitives, with performance primitives. And now here, things get much simpler. <clears throat> so again, here I have a slightly different approach. Here we do not use the CUDA uh, computation workflow, but instead we use the new uh, class uh, infrastructure where you decorate a member function as a kernel. That's an alternative approach. And then in this function, you organize your threads. You do the first reduction over the different blocks, over the whole row. And once you've reduced them, you do the reduction within a block with a performance primitive. Here you just call out to this performance primitive. So the code stays relatively small and simple. And then 
calling it is simple as well. You just have your multiply, you organize your threads, you launch it, you launch the second, uh, uh, you define the threads <coughs> for the second iteration, and you launch it again. So that's simpler. As soon as you have these performance primitives, you can combine them and get your kernels done much quicker. Can I switch to conclusion? Yeah. So conclusion is that with this so, uh, solution, you can program GPU algorithms at any level of detail with F sharp very easily. You get the full power, you get the same performance, you get a much better productivity, and it's much easier for you to assemble the data and prepare the data. Uh, for us, it's a big win on the projects because we are faster. We make less errors in the data before we actually go to the GPU because debugging on a GPU is relatively hard. And if you figure out that you have an error just because you sent the wrong data to the GPU, it's quite stupid because you can avoid this problem even before with better tooling and a better language. Cool. Okay, let's um, first thank Daniel for his talk. Uh, thanks. I, I think we've all got a, uh, a stronger feeling for what's involved in the sort of nuts and bolts of, of GPU programming and how that maps up through a complete compositional stack as well. We've had a lot of questions along the way. Are there any? We'll take one more question from or one or two more questions. Yeah. Uh, how difficult would it be to target also OpenCL as a backend? That well, it's not difficult. The problem is more uh, shall we do it or not? because now OpenCL has the spear uh, representation, or the, the spear uh, specification is, is finished. Uh, it's already there in version two. Uh, unfortunately, not that many vendor uh, support spear version two. And until we see uh, that vendors implement uh, this spe specification, we would be ready to do it. But it's more like you know, the market needs to evolve and uh, settle before we can do that. Okay, any more questions? Okay, let's thank Daniel again. Thank you.